sing that verse again. For the praises of man. For the praises of man. I will never, ever stand. For the kingdoms of this world, I'll never give my heart away or shout. chorus goes like this, only a God like you, only a God like you could be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith to only a king of all kings. Do I bow my knee and sing, give my everything, sing that again, only a God like you could be worthy of my praise. I bow my knee and sing, give my everything. And then it goes to only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, rewarder, to only a God like you do I give my praise. We're going to sing that first verse again for the praises of man. That way you can learn it. For the praises of man, I will never, ever stand. For the kingdoms of this world, I'll never give my heart away or shout my praise. My allegiance and devotion, my heart's desire and all emotion. Go to Be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith to only a king of all kings. Do I bow my knee and sing, give my end to only my maker, to only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, to only my maker, to only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer. To only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer, restore, rebuild, and rewarder. To only a God like you do I give my praise. Be seated, please. It's a joy to welcome you to the house of God this Lord's Day morning. It's so good to see all of you. Several first-time visitors. Praise God for that. We thank you so much. One of the things that keeps me and Adele motivated is wondering who we're going to see new in church on Sunday. <laughs> so we thank you for being here today, uh, fulfilling our wishes and answering our prayers. Uh, you regular people who are the good and faithful, tried and true, thank you also for your faithfulness to the ministry of the Lord here at Aviana Baptist Church. Uh, if you are a first-time visitor and you did not yet get a uh, little flyer that tells you all about our church with a visitor's card attached to it, would you please raise a hand so we can see where you are? There's one couple right there. We'll fix you up just in one minute. Please give me time to finish up here, and I'll be right back here to see you. Uh, if you can, fill out that little, green, that little visitor's card and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by, and then take the little sheet uh, that, uh, that flyer tells you about all the ministries our church does. When we have people who need that ministry and people willing to conduct that ministry, it's, it's all it depends on volunteer helpers, you know. 
But those are the, uh, all the ministries we have going at our church, and we, are, we think we have about as comprehensive a ministry program as any church our size you will ever find. So take a look at that, and, and any questions, you can always call me. be glad to talk with you about that. Right now, I'm going to ask Miss Jamie Williams to come up. She has a very important announcement to make, and I've told her she'd take till 12 o'clock. That's fine. We'll just say amen and go home. Sunday this year from 5 to 6.30, but to have a successful Awana program, we need volunteers. That's when all of you come in. <laughs> Amen. And I do have some volunteers already, but my volunteer sheet is very empty with names. So um, I've had the registration online for volunteers and for clubbers, and I also have some paper copies with me today. So after church, I'm going to be standing out in the lobby with those paper copies for registration for clubbers and registration for volunteers. Tonight at 5 o'clock, I'm having a training for volunteers. Um, we need people, in we need a leader for cubbies, we need a nursery helper, because we're also going to be having adult Bible study during that time. So we want to provide child care for all ages. And we're also going to try to offer middle and high school Awana clubs this year. So I need somebody who has a heart for the youth also. And I need tons of assistance, um, people to help listen to verses. I need a games leader. I need lots and lots of help. So if you have a heart and a desire for children and to share the gospel with them and, um, and you want to be a part of this amazing program, whether you were a child of Awana or your children have gone to Awana at other churches, Please talk to me um, after service today. I would love to see you tonight at 5 o'clock for um, training. And then in two weeks, we're going to start. We're going to try to advertise some on base to get some more clubbers and grow our program, which will also grow the body of Christ in our local community. And I have one other little announcement. Um, this is not a want base. But we are trying to um, start, make a Thanksgiving retreat. And we have looked into Schloss. How do you say? Schloss In Milstadt, Austria. It's a Christian um, retreat center. We preliminary contacted them. We think we might be able to work it out. They wanted more concrete numbers. So I have no idea who's interested, um, how far we should take this. So I just wanted to get a show of hands, but not just a hand raise. If you could, and Willie, if you could count that section for me. <laughs> Pastor, if you could count the middle, this okay. little section, and I'll count from here on. If you could show me, like, if you're a family of four and possibly interested in doing a Thanksgiving retreat, it would be Wednesday night to Saturday. Let me give this a little information. Okay. Millstadt is about two to two and a half hours drive from here. Very easy uh, trip. One of the most beautiful retreat sites you will ever go to in your life. And uh, it's staffed completely by Christian people. It's a wonderful spiritual atmosphere. A great place to have a retreat. Uh, like the easy access. Two, two and a half hours, depending on road conditions and traffic. Uh, easy little drive just up the road in Austria to Milstadt to this castle called Schloss Heraldeck. Now. Oh, oh, and so let me just tell you about what we've done in the past. I've, we've led Thanksgiving retreats from our church in Germany, and it's a family retreat. Uh, we eat dinner and breakfast together in the morning. We usually bring in a guest speaker that does a morning service with praise and music and, um, and a leading time, and the children will be provided in child care. More volunteers needed there. And then um, you're free in the afternoon. Go skiing, go sledding, do whatever. You have all afternoon to spend time with your family, to bond, and also to bond with other church members to bring our church closer together in Christ. And then we come back together, together at dinner, and then we usually have some kind of um, fellowship activity, whether it's a talent show or a sing-along or a campfire or something fun to do together as a group in the evening. I loved it. We went on every single one and ran one or two of them um, at our church in Germany. And it was a great time um, to get together and bond and to do something as a family. And you get to go to Austria. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a family of four and possibly interested, like raise your hand if you're six. Put your hand up, six. I just want to get, if this isn't a commitment, this isn't saying if you raise your hand, you have to go. I just don't know if it's 20, 50. I don't know, and they are looking for numbers because they do have another group um, at the church, I mean, at the center that weekend as well. Good? All right, so if you raise your hand with possible interest, we were, uh, I'll count. <laughs> Keep your hand raised. <laughs> okay. My section can put their hands down. 
Middle say, I've got 17. Okay. 13. Okay, 12, 17, 13. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I will get you more details on the retreat now that I have a, a rough number to tell them. And maybe next Sunday I can report back with what all it would actually entail. Let's work with 50 because more are going to jump on when they find out how much fun oh. we're having. Oh, okay. okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank all you right, for thank that. You. I hope to see you tonight for more practice training. Thank you. Okay. I never get applause when I make announcements. What's up? With <laughs> uh, she mentioned a Sunday night adult Bible study. Now, this, this gets a little touchy. I understand. We need lots of adults to work Awana because, you know, they need each, each club needs a director and an assistant, and then they need adults there to listen to the little children recite their Bible verses. And that takes a lot of adults, but we also want adults that aren't involved to come in here and sit down with us and have a little Bible study. And it's going to be tremendous because the first two Sunday nights we're going to use uh, two uh, DVDs by Louis Giglio. That hurts me to pronounce it that way because it's an Italian name and I know it's supposed to be pronounced Giglio, but he doesn't know that, so we'll go with Giglio. We'll call him anything he wants us to. Where he's going to use... Uh, visuals and statistics about the enormity of our universe to explain the existence of God, to prove the existence of God, I think. And then after that, we're going to go into a series of how to use the knowledge you have about God, your belief about God, in a tactical way to control conversations when you're talking with skeptics, uh, to keep things on the track, and, and that's going to be tremendous. So we'd like you to, if you, if you have children, we're going to bring them to Awana, you're not involved in anything in the Awana program, in here's a place for you, and uh, it's, it's a great thing if you have uh, people you're witnessing to and you can't get them to see the light, bring them here on Sunday nights at uh, 5 o'clock because we'll show them some stuff that will really make them go home and, and lay awake at night wondering what they just saw. Um, now, as to tonight, she's going to start the Awana training program from 5 to 6.30. Uh, I sent it out on email and put it on our Facebook ABC group. I don't know how many saw it. No one responded, but... Tonight, for the last time, Adele and I would like to host one of our Sunday night fellowships out at the house where we live. Uh, the, uh, tonight, the emphasis will be on uh, melons and fruit and healthy stuff to eat. You know, we're, we're not going to do ice cream floats tonight. We'll do healthy stuff. Uh, it's a time when we just get together in an informal way. We've got a huge yard, uh, places for the kids to play, for the adults to play, you know, football, frisbee, whatever you want to play. And we just sit around having a good time and getting to know each other better. Um, it, the timing of it is just right for the Awana people here in training to finish and get out there just about the time we start eating, Jamie. You, you, perfect, yeah. So um, <laughs> that'll, be, that'll work fine for those people. Now, I, what I'd like to see again is a show of hands. Do you think you'd like to come over to our house tonight at 6 o'clock and have some melon and fruit and fellowship? Because if there's not enough people, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> okay, that makes it a go. We'll be there at 6 o'clock looking for you. And uh, look forward to having you. Um, our Count Your Blessings ministry is up and running. It's kind of taken on its own life and moving ahead at its own pace. What is Count Your Blessings? The Ornelas family here on the front row have had a vision from God. They've been dealing with it for a while. And they've finally come to fruition to provide food and clothing for impoverished people here in Italy, whether they're immigrants coming from Africa or somewhere else, uh, Eastern Europe, who've got here in this country having a hard time making ends meet. We have food and clothing. Also, uh, Italian people who are having a hard time getting along, and a lot of Italians are having a hard time, thanks to this wonderful government they have here, uh, just to provide food and clothing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's already provided help to several families uh, who've been in the last two weeks to pick up stuff. Uh, if you happen to know people who are in a needy situation, refer them to this church. And uh, by the way, we ask you people who aren't needy, when you go to the commissary, just throw a couple extra items in your basket to donate to the food uh, closet here. Uh, leave off the taco kits and the hamburger helper because most immigrants would not know what to do with that, or Italians. We Americans know, but they don't. So get staple stuff like pasta, rice, beans, canned food, uh, stuff that people can recognize when they open it up and know what to do with it. And you can help us out a great deal. If you're getting ready to go through your wardrobe and get rid of unneeded clothing items, please get them clean and turn them in here. We have people who will be needing those things. They're asking for them, and uh, so it's a great thing that's going on here.
All right, am I missing any? Uh, yes, sir. Brother Bryce Ron coming up for an announcement. All right, so this Friday is going to be this month's Dudes Doctrine Debate Dinner. It's going to be this Friday here at the church because I didn't coordinate a place earlier. <laughs> so we're going to be doing it here at the church. The topic is going to be Calvinism versus Arminianism and anything that goes in on that debate. Um, I'm announcing it now, giving us a week time in order for you to research, see where you stand on those topics. And if you want to come out, we will discuss them in a <coughs> mostly organized manner and it gives you a chance to be able to defend your position and challenge yourself in why you believe a certain way. So there will be dinner here at the church this Friday at 6 for the guys, and we'll be discussing Calvinism versus Armenia. He forgot to say that not only we try to keep it organized, we try to keep it friendly. Sometimes. And that's not easy to do sometimes. All right, anything else out there that needs to be announced? Won't you spend a few moments with me right now worshiping the Lord in prayer, so please bow with me. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for the gift of prayer. Thank you for bowing your ear toward earth to hear us when we pray and for giving us a mediator, uh, a go-between between us and you who translates our prayers into something you can understand and respond to. We thank you, Lord, for that. Today, Lord, we pray for our nation. We have been for most of our lives the greatest nation on earth and sometimes right now it seems like we're being diminished and we just pray Lord that the United States of America can have a, a great spiritual revival will sweep across it from border to border coast to coast uh, to bring us back to God back to a, being a nation that you can continue to bless uh, throughout the rest of our lifetime as a, as a nation we pray for our leaders that they would have a godly point of view as they make decisions they'll uh, think more in terms of the benefit of the people out there instead of their own personal benefits, that we can have a nation, once again, that's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, one, one more time, we pray for that. We pray, Lord, for churches all across uh, North America, all across Europe, all across Africa, Asia. Lord, everywhere where Christian churches meet, may they grasp the vision you have for your church. May they embrace the mission. May they sell themselves out to do what you commissioned the church to do. Stop thinking about themselves, think about the world around them, and do everything they can to meet those spiritual needs out there so that many people in this world can come to know Jesus while there's still time. Uh, Lord, we have a good brother stuck at the airport in Amsterdam because of some kind of a strike here in Italy. We ask that you help Richard Starry get home safely this evening. Uh, we thank you for him and all he brings to our church, the time he's had away uh, to rest and uh, visit wonderful places from his past. We just ask you, Lord, to make it safe for him to get back home. We have some people in our church who are sick. You know every need. We pray for those people who have physical ailments. Lord, most of all, every one of us here knows someone who's not saved. We pray for those lost people and ask you, Father, to help us or help someone else say or do something that will point them toward the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can be saved. Now, Father, we want you to get uh, your honor and your glory out of this service today. So as we go through the rest of the service, be blessed by us. And Lord, in turn, bless us, we pray. Uh, we need you and we ask you to come down and visit us today and meet our deepest needs. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One time some people told Jesus, make those disciples of yours be quiet. And Jesus said, you know, if they hush, the rocks are going to cry out. When we go back to our singing ministry right now, I want you to sing like you don't want any rock doing your job. You'll do it yourself. Sing loudly. We're going to ask you to stand actually and take a few moments to greet one another in the Lord this morning before we go into our next song.
he is all we need. Lift up a heart of grace, sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Come, let us. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing to the King who's coming to reign. returning we watch and we pray Yeah. 
never leave you nor forsake you. And His word is true. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. We were sinners so unworthy. We were sinners so unworthy. Still for us He chose to die. Filled us with His Holy Spirit. We can stand and testify that His love is everlasting and His mercies, they will never end. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the dark. His light will shine. God is good. God is good. God is good. He's so 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 good. One more time. God is good. He's so good all the time. We're going to ask our ushers to come forward this morning to take the morning off. As the offerings pass this morning, we're going to ask you to stand and continue to worship with us. Uh, you can, as it passes, you can stand and worship if you like. Uh, but open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
Sing that with us one more time. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Pastor Sam this morning, uh, Father, that the message that he brings inspires us to uh, be a beacon of light in this community and here in Aviano. We say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Absolute all who will be kind and faithful when times are hard. 
uh, who will share one's joys and sorrows will be there regardless of the circumstances through thick or thin. And he was watching for a reaction, and his heart almost melted when he saw this wistful look come in her eyes with a sympathetic little smile play across her lips. And she said in the sweetest of old voices, I agree absolutely. That's a great idea. May I help you choose the right puppy? <laughs> You'll get it on the way home. It'll be okay. Aha. Plugged. That's not good. Um, how many of you have found in marriage exactly what you thought you would find when you got married? Yeah, it's on. Maybe I'll move it up a little bit. How many of you had expectations about marriage which, have, which haven't quite turned out to be exactly what you thought uh, when you, now that you've been into it for a while? Anybody, don't, don't raise your hands. I don't want you to embarrass yourself. <laughs> uh, it's a rhetorical question, as they say. It happens a lot of times. People get caught up in emotions of the moment and the feelings that they have, and they make life-changing decisions. And someday when reality hits, they look back and say, Woo, what am I doing here? And the temptation comes to say, Well, it was all a mistake. Let's just end it and go away. That's not God's plan for marriage. And what I want to talk to you today about is simply how to divorce-proof your marriage. How to divorce-proof your marriage. Looking back over the nearly 13 years now that Adelia and I have been here and the hundreds of couples we've seen flow in and out of this church, there are at least five I know of who sat right out there where you're sitting, looking every bit as pious and saintly as you look, as totally sold out to the Lord Jesus as you seem to be this moment, whose marriages have dissolved since they left here. And it's a heartbreaking thing as a pastor to know somehow <clears throat> something fell apart. Maybe there's something we missed in our ministry to those families. And I always want to be as best as I can helpful in keeping marriages together. I'm going to ask you to look with me in the Bible today at Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus spoke about this issue. And we want to talk about how we can divorce proof our marriages Matthew 19, beginning at verse 3. Matthew 19, verse 3 through 9. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then you are no longer two, but one flesh. <clears throat> Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for the gift of family. We thank you for the way you designed it and planned it and how you've uh, made it to work throughout all the centuries of human existence. We thank you. I thank you for the marriage you're sitting before me here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that somehow through these next few moments, you'll use the things I'm trying to say. Use your word to cement it in people's hearts. This is a lifetime commitment. There's no playing with it. There's no doing away with it. We're in it for life. That's my prayer for everyone here. And not only that they will make that commitment, but Lord, that day by day, their love for one another will grow stronger, their bonds grow tighter. They'll become more satisfied, more fulfilled in the relationships in which they find themselves this very day. Bless us, Lord, in our marriages. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Five marriages at least out of this church have fallen apart since the couples left here. It's a heartbreaking thing. I would like to say it's not ever going to happen again, and I, I hope it won't, but I can't really say that for sure. Now notice, the, you know who the Pharisees were? The Pharisees were the most religious people of their day. They were the ones who knew every one of the 613 command, commands 
included in the law of Moses. And they were so uh, intent upon keeping those laws, they created hundreds of other laws about how you fulfill the 613 that God gave us. These were morally upright people, very self-righteous, of course. But these were the most religious people of their day. They were students of God's Word. They knew what God's Word said. And yet they come to the Lord Jesus saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife and give, uh, give her a bill of divorcement? There's something in the human nature that's always looking for a loophole, isn't there? There's something about the human nature always looking for a workaround. We know what God said, but surely somehow or another there's a little leeway here for me to do things my way instead of his way. And that's kind of what these people were looking for. The answer that Jesus gave them should answer all of our questions concerning this subject. People have a tendency to look for a way out, but when questions arise, do what Jesus did. Turn to the Word of God. And that's what we're going to do here this morning. Someone just, well, my son, <laughs> I just borrowed a book from him about some things that Benjamin Franklin wrote during his time on earth that you, as the cover of the book says, you'll never read these in the history books in school, and you won't. He had a, a very whimsical sense of humor. He was a very imaginative, creative human being, and he wrote a lot of things that I don't want you to ever read, by the way, so I'm not going to let you have this book. But one of them, uh, he was telling a young, a young man had written him apparently <coughs> frustrated with uh, temptations to immoral activities and uh, Franklin was writing back to him a letter to try and encourage him, get married. That's the way to handle it. Get married. That'll take care of it. But then he's, in case you don't do that, then let me give you some good advice on how to pick the right, right mistress. Which, Ben, you shouldn't have done that. But anyway, in that very amusing letter to his dear friend, Franklin wrote, this was back in 1745, marriage is the most natural state of man and therefore the state in which you're most likely to find solid happiness. It is the man and woman united that make the complete human being. I can't tell you how many times since I've been here when uh, an active duty member got deployed, was gone for six or seven months, and they'd come back, and I'd meet the spouse who stayed behind, and they would say, he or she is back, and I'm whole again. I'm complete again. That, that's a beautiful picture. I love hearing people refer to it that way. I'm whole again, my other half has, has returned and we're together. That's a beautiful thing. But sometimes people have a hard time seeing it quite that way and, and have a hard time committing themselves to keeping it that way. And that's what we want to kind of deal with today. Jesus said, don't you know how it was at the beginning? Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden right after the dawn of creation when God created the first man and the first woman. And so you and I are going to spend a few minutes going back there today to see... In uh, the, the school of biblical interpretation, there's a theological principle known as the principle of first intent. What did God mean the first time he said that? And has he issued any amendments to it? <laughs> That's a stupid question, but people ask that all the time. People are looking for loopholes. Surely he's changed something about that somewhere along the road. No, he hadn't. If he said it at the beginning, it still holds true today. So I want you to look with me for a few moments here at this issue called marriage. Marriage. Ben Franklin says it's the most natural state of man. Well, back in Genesis 2.18, God is talking, uh, is thinking actually to himself, and, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. God desired marriage for the human race. It's not good for man to be alone. And so he gave him a gift. Now, wives, put this one in your pocketbook and take it home with you. You are God's gift to that man you're married to. And if he ever forgets that, remind him. Tick. And you can thank me later for that. Um, man alone is pretty much useless. <laughs> He's helpless. He needs help. And I'll, I'll give him my helper a, a a mate, a companion suitable, comparable to him. And so marriage came to the human race as a gift from God. God desired it, and he caused it to happen. He brought those two people together when there were only two there. And I love the fact that at the very first marriage ever conducted on earth, God was the presiding minister. How about that? And, you know, I think if people would do marriage God's way today, he would still be the dominant 
presiding minister at every wedding. He'd be the one there joining the two together. Sadly, not many people get him nearly as much involved as he would like to be. But that's the way it ought to be. God desired marriage for the human race. Then God also designed marriage. In Genesis 2.22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. He brought a female to the male and created marriage. Now, I don't know where you stand on all the stuff going on in our world today about uh, gay rights and same-sex marriage. I don't know where you stand on that issue, and I really do not care. I'm going to stand on the Word of God Amen. if everybody else in this world turns against me. Marriage is between one man and one woman. It's designed that way by God, and it's for a lifetime. It's not an interim. It's not an, an experiment. <laughs> it's not an interim process. It's a lifetime commitment between one man and one woman. That's the way it is. And Franklin said in his thing, it is the man and the woman united that make the complete human being. But God has said it's him and her, he and she, man and woman. That's marriage. He designed it. He took her out of man and gave her back to man and he intended for marriage to be between two people of, the op of opposite gender because his mission for them was that they would uh, procreate and, and replenish the earth, populate the world. That can only be done through heterosexual marriage. It can't be done any other way. Uh, the other arrangements just will not create uh, children. There's something extremely amazing going on in the United States. Uh, a district judge down in the state of Louisiana has upheld their uh, Defense of Marriage Act, whatever you want to call it, defining marriage as between a man and a woman. That judge upheld it in the state of Louisiana. Up in the 7th District, a panel of three judges have shot down the same kind of act for the states of Wisconsin and Indiana. And it's been shot down in other states. Now the idea is it'll have to go to the Supreme Court because district courts across the country are coming up with contrasting views of this issue, so it's going to wind up before the nine people who think they are the Supreme Court of the entire world. They got a surprise coming when they meet the true Supreme Judge one day. Amen. They're going to realize some of the mistakes they've been making. But here's the point. Marriage is under attack. I had read, uh, I, I saw a, a video clip of one of the female spokesperson for the LGBT group where she f said in, in a public place in front of hundreds of people, gay marriage is not the goal of our movement. The goal of our movement is to abolish marriage as an institution in, in America. And Ike sent me a lengthy article where someone wrote the same thing. They're not really all about same-sex marriages. They're about getting rid of marriage as, as an institution. So that way everybody becomes the ward of the state. And I don't know. It's just crazy. God designed marriage to be between a man and a woman. Uh, God defined it in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. One flesh. Now, I can get a little graphic sometimes when I'm trying to describe things I'm really passionate about. Let me ask you this. How would you feel, any of you out there, man or woman, if the right side of your body wasn't acting just right, or the left side of your body you wouldn't do, you know, I'm so right-handed I can do hardly nothing with my left hand. So what if I, that left hand doesn't do what I want, so I'm just going to have somebody bring a chainsaw and split me right down the middle, get rid of that left side, I don't need it anymore. Cut me in half, throw away the part I don't want. That is a pretty graphic picture of what happens when a couple decides they're going to get a divorce. The two have become one. And now we're going to cut that one right in half. That's a painful, painful thing to think about. It's not easy. God said they shall become one flesh. I think that means it's divorce proof. You don't go around sawing people in two. You don't go around sawing marriages in two. One man, one woman, one lifetime. God desired it. God designed it. God defined it. God defends it. God defends marriage. And there are going to be a whole lot of, Ameri of, of, of human beings, Americans and others, uh, all over Western Europe It's already pretty much fallen apart. They're going to be so surprised someday when they meet the defender of marriage. He says, ha ha, you blew it. All that stupid stuff you were doing in the name of human rights, you messed up. Now listen to this. God defends marriage. In nine, uh, chapter 19, verse 6 of our text that we read, so, longer, so then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. 
That is a very definitive statement from God. It's a command. It's, a, it's, it's the word with the bark on it, as they say back in Kentucky where I grew up. God has said, do not let man separate what God has joined together. Now, I was ordained in the gospel ministry by a grand old man who'd been saved since he was nine years old, preaching since he was 19, had years of experience. Today, to this day, he's still Delhi's favorite preacher. Uh, I'll never be able to replace him. <laughs> uh, but he and I had this discussion one time. I mean, we had to deal, you know, in churches, you have to deal with people who have had divorce. And I asked him, how do you handle that when people come and tell you that? And he said, Sam, you know, I take this view of it. Now, this is an old man I, I never disagreed with about anything except this. He said, it says what God has joined together. Don't let man put apart. How many of those marriages do you really think God had anything to do with? Well, I had to kind of confess that may be true. I mean, I wasn't exactly on my knees praying for permission to marry Adele, for example. And she, wasn't, she didn't seek God's permission to marry me. We, God wasn't, we had a church ceremony, of course. But I don't think either one of us would say that we consulted God before we got married. And uh, 45 years, uh, five months and some days later, we're still wondering, did we blow it? Or <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's the thing. It may be true that many, many people in the, that heat of passion and emotion, all that stuff you feel at the time, you just get married and, just, you know, you really don't get God involved, but listen, you just entered into an into a state that God ordained. If he was not personally involved, didn't have his fingers on the parts moving around and joining them together, you still entered into an institution that God ordained. The very first thing ever instituted on earth before ever there was a church or a government or a state or any of those other things, God created marriage. And you have entered into that state. It's God's institution you've entered into. So whether or not he was actually at the scene blessing what you were doing on the day of your wedding, you just entered into God's realm when you entered into marriage. So that makes it a holy, holy thing. And he says, do not let man. That means not any other man from outside the marriage. It means nobody inside the marriage has a right to separate that marriage. In Malachi 2.16, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord. Of host, therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God hates divorce because it covers your garments with violence. Well, sawing a, a body in half would be a pretty violent act, would it not? Breaking a marriage apart is a pretty violent act. Not physically, but emotionally. It is a terrible, terrible thing. Here's what you need to understand. Marriage is God's business. If I have voluntarily stepped into that institution, I put myself right in the middle of God's will for my life, and I am now supposed to, to, by God's direction, I'm supposed to make the most of it. I stepped into this thing, it's God's thing, so I have got to make the most of it. Regardless of whether or not you had God present at your wedding ceremony, now you're in God's realm and you're to make the most of it. So when marriage starts going bad, and sometimes they do, sometimes they do, take it back to the maker. Go back to the manufacturer and say, Lord, help us fix this marriage. Now listen, when they said, what about this thing with Moses? Now I want to tell you two things about that. People always ask me, okay, now I'm sitting in church, I'm saying, but I've got a divorce in my background. Why are you pounding on me? I'm not pounding on you, my friends. If you have done that which God hates and you're saved, it's under the blood and you and I have no problem, nothing to contend with, it's over and done with. Uh, one Greek scholar has studied that thing about that, that term, bill of divorcement, and he's found that that was the same term used in, in the, some of the Old Testament language. Like if you own a house and you sell your house to someone else and then you go over here and you buy a new house, uh, you now do not own two houses. You only own one house because that, that bill that you signed and gave to that other person separated you completely from any uh, right, any ownership of that previous house you now only own one house. So if you've been divorced, you do not now have two spouses. You only have one. Uh, that is the thing about it. But the second thing that, that Jesus said, he said, he said that because of the hardness of your hearts. Because of the It was never God's plan that there be divorce. God understood the human nature of, of the people he had created. He knew these things were going to happen, and he created 
an orderly way for it to transpire, but he still hates it. You understand what I'm saying? He still hates it. By the way, uh, the latest uh, district court ruling from out in the western part of the United States is that if we uh, ban multiple marriages, we are violating the religious rights of a certain group of people. So now polygamy is starting to get, and, and we have known this ever since the same-sex marriage thing started taking momentum. We've always said the next thing is going to be polygamy, and then it'll probably be pedophilia, and somewhere down the road, bestiality will come along, and who knows? Who knows where it's going to end? But no, God said give the bill of divorce. He didn't want a man having two wives. Get rid of, if you're going to marry another, separate from that one, break that bond, and then you marry another. Only one wife per man. Um, Wives, you can thank me for that later on too. God had a plan. It was a marvelous plan, a perfect plan. But he knew that the hardness of men's hearts. Now, okay, what would this hardness look like in a man's life today? It can take many, many forms. Somebody can get the idea, well, you know, when, I think maybe wives are usually the ones who take this point of view. When we were dating, he treated me like a princess. He brought me flowers and chocolate and took me where I wanted to go and he just showered me with affection and attention all the time. And now we're married and it's over and I want out. This is not what I expected. The guy, you know, looking at the girl, boy, you know, when we were dating, she was the hottest thing on the earth and I just love that girl. Well, now we've gotten married and she's kind of let herself go. She doesn't make up and do her hair and doesn't wear the same kind of clothes. She doesn't wear the same perfume. I come home in the evening, she's been cleaning the house all day, she looks like a maid, not a wife. Well, I want out. That's hard-heartedness. People come into marriage with, with unrealistic expectations. They want those expectations fulfilled. The hardness of the heart says it's got to be this way or no way. When they don't get it, the hardness of their heart causes them to want to get out of there. Somebody looks across the fence, sees what looks like a prettier little heifer or bull on the other side. Man, hey, oh, whoa, that's where I want to be. And the hardness of heart, I deserve what I want and I'm going to get what I want. That's hard-heartedness. I'm going to do what I want to do who, regardless of who it hurts. And so you jump the fence. You get over and find out, well, it's really no better over here than it was over there. But anyway, the hardness of our hearts, it, it can manifest itself in many, many ways. Never God's plan for marriage to end in divorce. The fact that he gave it a, an orderly way to happen just means he understood the hardness of men's hearts and that people are going to make mistakes, they're going to misinterpret things. Well, I want to move along here because the hour is getting late. You know, God gave us ten commandments in the law of Moses. You know them, the big ten. The ones that you can't put on courthouses or school grounds anymore in America. The ten commandments. I've gone through them and looked at them and I've come up with what I call ten commandments for marriage. And I believe if every couple would get these ten things, these ten laws in their mind, as I have them on paper here, uh, I think they're going to be up on the board. Yeah, I got them up there. Um, and you, because, you, because you have studied Exodus chapter 20 and you know the ten big commandments by heart, you'll, you'll see the relationship between what I'm doing here and what's in the Word of God. Commandment number one for marriage. You shall have no other person before your spouse, neither parents nor children, friends or relatives, no, nor any other person. The commandment in the Bible says you'll have no other gods before me. You shall have no other person before your spouse. In the text we read today, God uh, said, man, will, you, you will leave your father and your mother. Well, people pretty much understand that. We have our own family now. We're not under mom and dad's rule anymore. People have a hard time sometimes with the issue of children Oh, uh, I've carried this little kid in my uh, womb for this, you know, 40 weeks and I've given birth and it hurt and then I've got this. Kid. So surely I'm supposed to love this child more than I do my husband. Oh, no. That's not what God says. You should have no other person before your spouse. Take good care of your children. Love them. Give them that mom and dad team that they need to see. You can't be loving those kids more than you love the person you're married to. There's only one institution in all the human experience that God said is equal to the relationship between Jesus and the church. That's the relationship between a man and his wife. Not a, a woman and her children, not a man and his children, no one and their parents. Only husbands and wives are comparable to Jesus and the church. So that is the most important relationship in your life, bar none. 
There's nothing to compete with it. You shall have no other person before your spouse. Number two, in the Bible it says you make no graven images. You have no statues and stuff up in your church. The Catholic Church, by the way, has removed this one from their Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself any other image, carved, painted, photographed, or imagined. You're not going to be married to one person with visions of other people dancing around in your head all the time, titillating you and exciting you. You're just not going to allow that. You're going to do like Job. You're going to make a covenant with your eyes not to look on anybody else. You're, you have eyes only for the person to whom you're married. It's, it's painful to know what other images in people's minds have done to marriage in our country today. Commandment number three says, you do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In marriage, you shall not give your spouse vain names, neither in anger nor in jest. Are we always tempted to call our spouse something ugly when they make us unhappy? Sure. We shouldn't do that. They have a name. And you have several affectionate terms you can use to speak to them and of course, you can turn those really ugly by using the wrong tone of voice. Honey, you know, <laughs> be careful how you speak to, the, to your spouse. Do not give them any vain names. Commandment number four is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Commandment number four for marriage. Remember every day with your spouse to keep it holy. Remember that you are both children of the living God and joint members of a royal priesthood. You've got to treat that spouse like a child of God a prince or a princess in the kingdom of Almighty God. Respect them that way. Be affectionate toward them. Treat them that way. Commandment number five in the Old Testament says to honor your father and your mother. Commandment number five for marriage, honor each other as the father and mother of your children. You wouldn't want anybody treating your children's mom or dad badly, would you? And you can't do it either. If someone else came along, treated the mother or father of your children badly, you'd probably pick up a stick and wade into them and teach them a lesson or two. Well, we don't want anybody wading in and teaching you a lesson with a big stick. We just want you to honor your, the, the parents of your children, the one you're married to, the one with whom you made those children. Treat that person knowing that the children are watching all the time. You may think that the children don't know when there's stress and tension in marriage. Children have little built-in radars, and they know when things aren't going well between mom and dad, and it affects them in a very negative way. Old Testament commandment number six, you shall not kill or commit murder. Commandment number six for marriage, you shall not kill the affections of your spouse by harsh words, disrespectful actions, or attention, nor should you kill, shall you kill the trust of your spouse by questionable activities or relationships. You know, we can behave in such a way that it will kill either the affection or the trust of the person we're married to. You shall not do that. If you do, you're responsible for the negative things that happen. It, uh, you have to be on the guard not to do things that are going to harm that relationship. You do not want their affection being wounded. You do not, do not want their trust to be broken. Do things right. Number seven, practically the same as it is in the Bible. You shall not commit adultery. I added to it just these words. Neither shall you even think about it. That's hard. Somewhere down the line you've probably heard the old saying that idle hands are the devil's playthings. That's true. But I'll tell you this, an idle mind is the devil's playground. And what goes on in the mind will oftentimes affect what happens with the hands. Don't even think about adultery because you start thinking about it, next thing you'll, you'll start accepting it as being okay, and the next thing you know you'll be doing it. You don't even think about adultery. Old Testament commandment number eight, you shall not steal. You shall not steal from your spouse by withholding words of love, praise, encouragement, or forgiveness, or by withholding matrimonial love. If you don't give your spouse encouraging words, words of praise, love, uh, even forgiveness, you're robbing them of something that they deserve to have from you. We don't have a whole lot of trouble with sometimes saying love, occasionally praising, maybe a, a, every now and then a little encouragement. We have a hard time with the forgiveness issue, don't we, sometimes? We have a hard time with that one. Ever since I've been in the ministry doing premarital counseling back in the States, and I did a lot of it, and I've done a lot of marriage counseling here, and I tell people always, and I believe this with all my heart, in marriage, the three most important words are not, I love you. The three most important words in marriage are, I forgive you. 
Because if you can't forgive the things that other person does that you did not want them to do or did not like them doing or that hurt you, your marriage is not going to go forward. I told you about five marriages out of our church who have broken apart. There have been two who left here who had every reason under the sun based on what Jesus says here. Because of adultery, they easily could have fallen apart and no one would have ever blamed either one of them, the, 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 the wife from, from divorcing the husband. They found a way to forgive and they're still together stronger now than they've ever been. Even adultery is forgivable. And think about it for a moment. Jesus says many times in the, in the Gospels, you'll be forgiven the same way you forgive. Have you ever committed adultery against the Lord Jesus? You ever let something else take first place in your life and scoot him aside? Sure you have. Has he forgiven you? Sure he has. So if your spouse cheats on you, forgiveness is the first mode, way to handle it. I hear people say, well, I can forgive anything except that. Well, I hope God doesn't look at you with the same attitude because you're in trouble if he does. Withholding matrimonial love. Some people use that as, as a weapon in marriage, don't they? I, I hope you don't. Now, I, I, I got a sense of the little area here. I, I'm going to try to handle it as uh, maturely as I can so I don't scandalize anybody. But that is a part of the marital bond. It's a gift from one to the other. It's not to be used as a weapon, <laughs> as, a, a, as a tool to get your way in marriage. It's to be shared by both for the mutual benefit of each other. Two uh, beautiful young ladies, you sit right out there, posted something on Facebook a few weeks ago. And it amazed me, uh, they were sharing back and forth about how much they agreed with what was in this article. It was written by a Christian woman, and she was advising women, claim your matrimonial rights every night. And I, what does she mean by that? So I read it. See, you've worked hard all day. You're bedraggled. You're befuddled. You can, you can go through the day, think about all the things going wrong, or you can think about tonight when I get him in bed. Here's what's going to happen. And what you think about all day will affect how you feel when your husband comes home to work or whatever. And claim, you, you deserve it. And there's no better way to end a bad day than that. Uh, all the time they were here in church, I thought those big, beautiful smiles on their face was the joy of the Lord and the fact they had a great pastor. <laughs> now I'm beginning to question. Um, was that it or not? That is a, it's a marital bond. God gave it to you. Enjoy it. And do not use it as a tool to hurt the person you're uh, living with. Number nine says in, in the Bible, you shall not bear false witness. And in marriage... You shall not bear false witness to your spouse, but shall always speak the truth in love. Always speak the truth in love. Now let me say this, because it, we get into a kind of a dangerous area here. Oh, by the way, husband, you can thank me for that later on too. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes, if you're living together, one spouse will notice the other's going off on the wrong track here and needs a little correction. They need a little truth that is going to maybe not please them. Well, how do you handle that? You don't grab them by the ear or grab them by the hair, bounce them upside the head and say, you moron. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. In a way that they will understand, you see a little flaw, you're trying to help them correct it lovingly, gently, affectionately, you're trying to help them avoid a mistake that's going to hurt them somewhere down the road. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. Don't be a liar in your own family. See, if the two become one flesh, when you lie to your spouse, you're lying to yourself. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Lord made it very clear. Whatever harm one spouse does to the other, they're doing it to themselves. So don't do that. And number 10, you shall not covet. And in the Bible, it mentions several things you're not supposed to covet. Commandment number 10 for marriage, you shall not covet by, being demanding, by, by demanding from your spouse more than you yourself are willing to give. It's amazing how many people in marriage expect so much from the person they're married to but are willing to give so little. No, whatever you expect from your, your spouse, you be willing to do. Do not covet more from them than you're willing to give them. The, you know, the thing we call the, the uh, golden rule, as you would that others should do unto you, do you likewise also unto them. 
hardly ever does that get applied to marriage, but that's the place where it belongs, right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. You got any closer neighbors than the person you're married to? Love that person just as much as you love yourself. Treat them just exactly the way you want them to treat you, and you'll be amazed at how things will turn out. Now, I got slide number 10 up here just as a conclusion. Don't leave me, Helen. Can't we talk about it after the golf tournament? She's walking out the door. In marriage, it is so easy to let other priorities take over what should be our top priority. I'll change our second priority, which is our marriage. Our first priority is our relationship to God. Second priority should be our relationship to our spouse. And if we aren't careful, we let other things get in the way and, and move that out of second place and, and, and move into its place. We should never, ever do that. We can't do that. I have before me here a stack of things I call a marriage assessment questionnaire. I think I got 21 copies of it off the copy machine over there. I'm going to make these available to you, and I want to tell you up front, it takes a brave couple to take this thing home and deal with it because the questions are kind of hard. But they're designed to make people right now while your marriage is still going good, while everything is peace and happiness and joy at your home, take a look at your marriage to assess why is it going good, where are the weak points where someday in the future it could go bad, what can we do to make it better right now. And let me tell you this too, it doesn't matter how good your marriage is, in Christ it can get better. He's always trying to give a more abundant life than the one you're having now. I'm going to make these things available out there in that uh, welcome center as you leave. I, I was so tempted to put them in the bulletin and have everybody have one, but you would think I'm being pushy and meddling and I don't want to do that. I have them out there. You can take one home. I don't want to see the answers. I really, unless you want, if you find something you need to talk with me about, then I'm, I'm here. I'm your pastor. I'll talk with you. I want you to see the answers and then react the way those answers tell you to react. They will guide you in things, and I hope you'll take it and be serious about it. Marriage was God's idea. He desired it, designed it, defined it, and defends it. And I believe that people who don't treat marriage seriously will find that God defends it sometimes in ways that you don't like. Make marriage a lifetime commitment. Understand it belongs to God, and I'm simply a steward of it. And if you give it to God, he will divorce-proof it for you. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for all the beautiful young families sitting before us today. I wish I could tell them that if they'll just be loyal Christians, they'll never have a problem in their marriage. But I know people who've been loyal Christians who've had serious struggles. I just pray for every married couple out here today. I wrap a bond of Christian love around them, Father, and ask you to bring your defense into their marriage so that nothing can ever separate them from one another. And may they, Lord, as they live together, the way Adele and I have for more than 45 years now, may their love grow stronger day by day. I can look at my wife today and say, Honey, I love you way more today than I did the day I married you, and I mean it. And I want every couple out there to have that same feeling about their spouses. Bless us, Lord, in our marriages. Help us to honor and glorify you by the way that we relate to one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now we're going to have our hymn of decision. Uh, I haven't said anything about evangelism or getting saved today, but I do want to say this to you. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, the greatest ally in your marriage is missing. He's not there. And you need to bring him in as your Lord and Savior today and make a commitment to walk through life the way he wants you to do. That will help you secure your marriage and divorce-proof your marriage. So invite Christ into your heart. Say, Lord, I don't understand everything I need to know. I do know I'm a sinner. I know I can't change myself. I know Jesus died on the cross for me. And he said if I would trust him, he would take away all my sins, make me a new person, give me a new life. I want that, so I invite him in today. We'll help you learn the things you need to know later on. You just need to know when you leave here today, Christ lives in me because I've put my trust in him and invited him in. He said, those who come unto him, he will turn no one away. So come to him today if you're, if you're not saved. We'd like to talk with you about church membership, about uh, serving in the church, about prayer requests on your mind. You may be a Christian and needs to rededicate your life. Come and kneel at the altar. You don't have to speak with me. Come and talk to God. He knows you already. He knows you better than you know yourself. 
And you won't surprise him with anything you say. So come and just kneel up here and talk to the Lord about things in your life today. This invitation hymn is a time for you to do what God the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. And we challenge you right now, follow the leadership of God the Holy Spirit. Please stand and let's sing together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, without you, I Thank you so very much for being in the house of God today. I hope the message will mean something to you. You'll take something home from here that will help you out through all the challenges of life. A couple of things I want to say to you. We're going to leave right now, those of us who are interested. We're going to form a little caravan, drive just up to the second roundabout on AP Highway, going up past the flight line. We're going to bear off to the left here. We're going to look at a prospective building to become our new church home sometime uh, next year. I hope you'll come with us because ultimately you'll be the people who will make the decision. We have to move. That's not uh, debatable. We have to move by November 2015. We're looking around for new places. Please get in your car and just wait. We'll guide you. It's just up to the second roundabout and off to the left. And we'll show you that building. The man's going to be there to open it, let us inside to see the space and that kind of thing. I'll assure you, it does not look like a church today, but it can be turned into one. This place here used to be a grocery store. 
<laughs> it's a church today. So please come with us uh, and see that. Tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, our house, melons and fruit and just good Christian fellowship. Please come. Uh, and we'd be so happy to have you. Awana volunteer training, 5 o'clock here today. As soon as you leave here, you can come out the house and get some watermelon. We'll be delighted to have you. All right, right now you're going to sing a song. Won't you leave here with a song in your heart, a smile on your face. Be happy. When people ask you what's wrong with you, tell them it's Jesus. I've been afflicted and I can't get over it. God bless you. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came. Yesterday it was her birthday, so give her a round of applause. <laughs> Forty years of age, the top of the hill. It's all downhill from here. Uh, uh, the uh, Liz Dowd with her camera will be standing right outside. If you're attending church regularly here, we do not yet have a picture for our family board out in the welcome center. Please stop and let her take your picture today, so we can put you up there with your name. That helps everybody get name and faces connected. It's a very helpful thing. So God bless you as we go. Have a great week.